Hello, PsyQ community, and welcome to today's discussion, the interplay of major depressive disorder and chronic pain, managing the challenges. Today's podcast is sponsored by Otska Pharmaceutical Development Commercialization Incorporated and Lundbeck LLC. My name is Jason Carter from the Otska Medical Affairs Team, and today we'll be speaking with Dr. Clay Jackson. Welcome to PsyQ, Dr. Jackson. Thanks very much, Jason. I am looking forward to having this time of discussion and learning together with our colleagues of the PsyQ community. So with that, let's get right to it. We're gonna be talking again about the impact of chronic pain and depression, major depressive disorder, and how they interact. When we look at chronic pain, we tend to focus on the biologic source of the pain, be that nociceptive injury due to trauma or infection or illness, it might be due to cancer, it might be a neuropathic injury due to nerve damage. And that's sort of the sweet spot of the modern biomedical model but chronic pain is a perfect illness for illustrating the wisdom of the Engelian biopsychosocial model because psychological and social factors also impact chronic pain to a great extent. From psychological factors such as sleep, fear, anxiety, depression, the coping skills of the patient, and then work, family, and social network aspects of the patient's social sphere have an impact as well. All of these come to have an impact on the patient's health-related quality of life. This has to do with physical functioning, daily life activities, mental health, social and family functioning. So if you look at acute pain or acute injury, that's strictly a biomedical phenomenon for the most part. However, chronic pain is not just acute pain with sort of groundhog day syndrome, same stuff, different day. Chronic pain really heavily emphasizes the psychosocial and spiritual aspects of the integrated medical model. So not surprisingly, if we look at patients who have major depressive disorder, they have a high prevalence of pain. Here's a study of about 2,000 patients, and what we see is about two-thirds of patients who had MDD actually reported pain symptoms. And if you look at the right side of the slide, among patients with depression who had relapse, 90% had mild to moderate residual symptoms. And if you look at those residual symptoms, 94% of patients have residual general somatic symptoms. And that can lead to relapse with major depressive disorder. So once we get people into response or remission, we have to look for those residual symptoms, and often those are symptoms of pain. 45% of depression treatment complete and partial responders experience residual pain symptoms. So about half of patients that have a remission or response will have that residual pain. And that can be a problem because it can be a nexus or nidus from which the disease can rise again in a full-blown major depressive episode. If we look at the association of MDD with chronic pain, this is a huge cross-sectional survey across 19 countries, 52,000 patients. And they looked at patients who had MDD and they correlated with chronic neck and back pain. And it looks like there was, if you just looked at it to two variables, it about doubled the incidence of chronic neck and back pain. And if you did multi-regression analysis, there was still a 40% increase in pain if you had major depressive disorder as opposed to the general population or the expected incidence. If you look at the odds ratio, there was sort of a dose-response relationship. If patients had more severe depression, more severe depression on the HAMD score, then what you found is that there was a greater likelihood that patients would develop chronic pain. About 10% of them develop chronic pain, but if you had more severe depression, more likely to develop the chronic pain syndrome. So is there a subset? Is there a particular type of MDD that typically develops chronic pain? Well, there might be. Common symptoms in patients who have comorbid MDD and chronic pain include low energy, disturbed sleep, and worry or anxiety. Uncommon symptoms are loneliness and guilt. Patients with depression and chronic pain tend to be those who have physical symptoms. They have sort of what we used to call atypical depression symptoms, and they also worry about the future as opposed to ruminating about the past. If we look at this bi-directional relationship between pain and mental illness, let's just look at it going forward. And this is a, a huge cohort study in Sweden, half a million patients. And if you look at pain, it doubled the risk of developing mental illness over the 10-year period. If you looked at mental illness, it doubled the risk of pain. If you look for a specific chronic pain condition such as fibromyalgia, which as you know, involves central sensitization to painful stimuli, there was even a higher comorbidity. And again, it was bi-directional, four times more likely to have mental illness if you had fibro. If you had a mental illness, you were about six times as likely to develop fibromyalgia. 
If we're looking for a model to explain these comorbidities between chronic pain syndrome as well as major depressive disorder, then we really look across the spectrum of life development, all the way from the genetic code and epigenetic modulation through the network level of neural circuitry, the neuroendocrine autonomic and immune dysregulation that occurs in sort of the three super highways of brain body connection, and then at cellular and subcellular levels. So it's not all about the synapse and certain neurotransmitters. There are multiple body systems that communicate between the brain and the rest of the body backwards and forwards that result in neuropsychiatric symptoms of depression as well as systemic manifestations of chronic pain. I do wanna pay attention to the leftward bar there that's in the lower left-hand corner, the gray bar that says epigenetic modulation. And note that life is, is, is not five card stud. It's not just the cards that you draw, it's how you play your cards. We have our genes, but the genes can be turned on and off through acetylation and methylation. And this often occurs as a result of early life adversity, which can set us up for inflammation. And that inflammation can also drive depressive and painful symptomatology later in life. So there are some common genetic and epigenetic substrates that can come to play, as well as brain structures, circuits, autonomic structures, and immunologic structures that tend to cohere with these two chronic illnesses. We see that there are some genetic links, and we mentioned these genes can be turned on and off. I'll just draw attention to a few pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-1 and IL-6. That epigenetic modulation can result in a higher inflammation, as we mentioned. There are also neurotrophic factors, such as BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that can have reduced productivity in patients with early life adversity. Opioid receptor genes can be altered, and certainly that would explain why some people may not respond appropriately or as expected to chronic opioid therapy for chronic pain. Glutamate receptor genes can be altered. Dopamine receptor genes can be altered. And this can affect reward systems in the brain as well as positive mood in the brain. And then CRF or cortotrophin releasing factor can be altered. And this of course has to do with the immunologic pathway, the HPA axis of the brain. If we look at the theories of comorbidity from a neurobiologic, environmental, and then cognitive and behavioral sets of domains, we can see that neurobiologically, as we've been talking about, the neurotransmitters are important. Serotonin, norepinephrine, glutamate, and GABA all have an influence on depression and the modulation of pain. If we're looking at brain structures that are involved, the anterior insula is a structure that's involved in sort of perceiving the body and knowing what's happening in the body and tends to deal with some negative information or negative mood. The prefrontal cortex, of course, helps us to rationalize our experiences. The anterior cingulate cortex is a connection between the limbic system and modulating negative emotions and getting that information to the prefrontal cortex so that we can think about how we're thinking or how we're feeling. And then the thalamus, of course, being sort of grand central station for taking ascending pain signals and distributing through the brain so you can tell where you're hurting, what it means, et cetera. Certainly, environmental factors are incredibly important. We talked about adverse childhood experiences or adverse childhood events, so-called ACEs, and these may set up pro-inflammatory changes in the body through epigenetic modulation of our genetic code. Later in life, we can have significant life events that may uncover this sort of genetic and epigenetic diathesis for the development of both mood and pain symptoms. If we're looking at cognitive behavioral influencers, well, having fewer pleasurable activities can affect patients' mood. Fewer social rewards can affect patients' mood, as well as their perception of pain. Catastrophizing is a huge issue in terms of connecting pain and depression. What is catastrophizing? That's assuming the worst about any scenario. If I go to shop, then people are going to look at me funny, they're going to treat me badly, or my back's going to begin to hurt again because I can't walk, and it's going to be awful, I won't be able to get home, and, and patients sort of ramp up into the worst possible scenario. Obviously, depression impacts insomnia, as well as chronic pain. If patients can't sleep properly because of pain or positional changes, then that can affect sleep, and that has a feedback loop to both mood and to painful symptoms. And then fear-based avoidance, as we talked about, these are scenarios that CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy can be effective. If we look at chronic pain, it's more than a feeling with apologies to Boston. Patients with chronic back pain were actually shown to have about 10% less neocortical gray matter volume than controls. This is equivalent to about a decade or two of normal senescence in terms of brain tissue loss. And so it does affect the brain's hard drive. 
if you will. Executive working memory areas do have a role in pain inhibition. We talked about the brain cortex there. The default mode network alterations can occur as well. What's the default mode network? It's basically negative rumination that gets turned on through depressive modalities. And patients with chronic pain can have these DMN alterations that cause them to have negative rumination as a result of their pain. The amygdala in the limbic system that has to do with positive and negative emotions can be altered with neuropathic pain. And then we see dorsal anterior insular alterations in MDD and chronic pain. And again, the, that anterior insula is a high dollar real estate because it has to do with processing negative emotions and relaying that information to the prefrontal cortex. Here's just an illustration of how we think the amygdala may ramp up or ramp down painful stimuli based on the mood that we have. If patients are in a high stress environment, you may consider the amygdala as sort of a rheostat, that's sort of a dimmer switch, if you will, that, that can increase the amplitude or the gain of painful symptoms. Whereas if we have positive emotions or positive experiences, then it can ramp the pain signals down. And so this is an important illustration of how deep brain structures such as the limbic system can have an effect on painful stimuli. And this may be another sort of structural or functional explanation of how MDD and chronic pain interrelate. Here we can see that pain and depression can be a vicious cycle because the presence of pain diminishes recognition and treatment of depressive symptoms. And so it can actually cover up depression. And this is a common in clinical practice, particularly in primary care, when patients present with painful symptoms, their psychologic symptoms may be downplayed by the patient and may be under-recognized by the practitioner. This is unfortunate because pain actually worsens depression outcomes. It decreases quality of life. It increases healthcare utilization. It increases symptom severity. It decreases work function, increases relapse, and decreases remission rates. Well, depression also worsens pain outcomes. It increases pain complaints. It increases the stigma of chronic pain treatment, and it can increase impairment in work and social structures. If you look at higher levels of pain, it actually lengthens the time to remission in MDD. In the study, you see on the left here, 12 weeks to remission if you did not have painful symptoms versus 17 weeks to remission if you did have painful symptoms. That's a very important time period because if a patient goes to 12 weeks, a separate study showed that their overall chance of remission is reduced, possibly by up to one third. Here's an important study called the ARTIS study that showed that SSRIs, although they're quite capable of relieving psychic symptoms of depression, are not very good at all at relieving the physical and painful symptoms of depression. What you're looking at is a graph of effect size, and you see that depressive symptomatology is quite well relieved, an effect size of about 1.3. Positive well-being very much increased with SSRIs, but you take a look at the gray bar and the blue bar, non-pain somatic symptoms were not very well relieved, and then the worst treatment outcomes were in patients painful somatic symptoms. And so what you see is SSRIs are typically not sufficient for relieving pain in patients with MDD. However, a different class of antidepressants, the SNRIs, have been shown to be effective in reducing pain. And here you see that if patients were switched to an SNRI, a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, that their painful symptoms were about cut in half. It's a large study of about 400 patients. Well, how do the SNRIs work in terms of reducing painful symptoms? We believe that there's dysregulation of serotonin and norepinephrine in the brain that's strongly associated with depression, but the same imbalance may be true in the spinal cord. It looks to be that there are descending corticobulbar pathways that run from the brain to the spinal cord that basically inhibit ascending pain signals. And by activating norepinephrine and serotonin together, we may activate these descending inhibitory pathways to sort of shush the pain signal from rising from the spinal column to the brain. So again, if we look at the proposed mechanism of SNRIs and how they may affect patients with the MDD and pain, it appears that patients who don't even have depression may have an analgesic effect from SNRIs. And this is why we feel that you don't have to drive the depressive symptomatology in order to reduce the painful symptomatology, that it actually is an independent mechanism. If you look at antidepressants that inhibit both norepinephrine and serotonin, they have stronger analgesic effects. And again, that harks back to the artist study that we saw that showed SSRIs were not particularly effective in relieving painful symptoms. There are some examples from patient populations with direct analgesic effects. 
diabetic peripheral neuropathic pain and depression, and fibromyalgia and depression. In those studies, it was shown that the effect of the analgesia was not completely dependent on the effect on the depression. There are multiple connection points between MDD and chronic pain in terms of body-brain connectivity. Peripheral and dorsal horn neuron sensitization can generate a disruption of cortolimbic processing of pain in vulnerable patients. There are functional and structural changes in the brain that can result in descending pain facilitation and inadequate descending inhibition, as we discussed with serotonin and norepinephrine. Neuroendocrine dysregulation, the CRF, the HPA axis dysregulation can impact pain signaling through increased inflammation. And then mesolimbic abnormalities in the dopamine system may alter reward systems and mood systems and impact pain processing as well. We talked about catastrophizing as an important link that occurs between MDD and chronic pain. This is a study of about 700 older adults, and it showed that catastrophization was actually the mediator between depression and pain intensity. If you look at patients who have back pain, separate study, there was no effect on depression when catastrophizing and other cognitive factors were controlled. There is evidence for a type of patient, sort of a pain personality, and there are two characteristics of patients that may be predictive of pain, increased harm avoidance and decreased self-directedness. That increased harm avoidance is what we talked about with catastrophization of, you know, everything's going to be bad. I can't go out because I'm going to hurt. And so patients just sort of ratchet down their social activity and their work function, their family activities. And it's a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where they don't do well because they fear not doing well. Decreased self-directedness has to do with internal versus external locus of control. And patients who have an external locus of control, they have decreased self-directedness. Life sort of happens to them rather than being an active agent in their own health and wellness. Those patients tend to do quite poorly. If we look at CBT in the next slide, what we can see is that CBT is very effective for chronic pain. It doesn't necessarily have to be focused on mood symptoms or depression, but it can be focused on quick objective elements such as symptom relief and increasing physical function, reducing catastrophization. And we underutilize this in multidisciplinary care. CBT is not used as often as it should be. And if you don't have access to a counselor, if you don't have access to a psychologist, but the patient's willing to participate, online CBT can improve pain outcomes. And it might be a resource, particularly for our practitioners who are laboring in rural care environments where access to high quality in-person CBT might not be available. Well, guys, that concludes our program today on the interconnection of chronic pain and major depressive disorder. I hope that you can see that there are brain and body connections that link these two devastating illnesses, that they're not only comorbid, they're co-contributory, and they actually make each other worse, and they make our treatment more challenging. However, it can be incredibly rewarding to treat these patients successfully. And if we sort of attack the symptomatology in multidisciplinary ways, we can be quite effective in helping these patients to live fuller and more robust lives. Best wishes to you as you treat your patients in the most effective ways possible.